Hi, uh, John Hoagland with Top Step here with you. Uh, and I have a very special guest to introduce to everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Andrew Meneker. Now, Dr. Meneker is somebody who we did some business with or did uh, some, some content with a few years ago. Some of you that have been with Top Step for a Trader may remember the good Dr. Meneker. We did, uh, it was called, uh, um, what was Market it? therapy. Market therapy. It was on this the Squawk Radio that we did. And I want to be really honest and say, I can't tell you how excited I am to be back here with you and with the good doctor. And without further ado, this is the great Dr. Andrew Maniker. Andrew, doctor, Thank you. great to see you. Thank you, John. I have to say it was a wonderful surprise to see your email in my inbox a few weeks ago asking how I am and asking if I'd like to do some stuff with you guys again. And it was really, it was really nice to see that email. So thanks for reaching out. Well, and, and thanks for, you know, uh, responding so quickly and being so eager to help our, our trading community. That's really what we're all about here. Um, so, you know, Dr. Menneker, I'm sure he's going to tell you all about it, is, is a doctor of psychology. The question I think is probably going to be on most people's minds is, how did you get involved in, in trading? Where did that come from? It's a great, uh, it's a good question. And it's a, I think even a decent story. I never, ever, ever had a business class in college, never even took an economics class. And to be honest, at that point in my life, I wasn't that interested in things like markets and whatnot. But coming out of grad school with my PhD, I had to uh, get some work. I had a lot of student loan debt. So one of the first gigs that I had was doing consulting work with the Defense Department. Specifically, a lot of it was with the Navy, um, Naval Aviators, actually, and some Special Forces training. And so in my work with that, I, I, yeah, yeah, I did like a lot of, um, began with stress management work. And then it, it, they pulled me into threat assessment stuff, which I had no background in and no training in. And I realized quickly that most people don't actually have formal training in it either. So I learned it kind of on the job. And I got pulled into this kind of a high profile, potentially dangerous situation in the uh, early 90s here in the Bay Area. There was a threat that was made against the Naval Air Base here on Alameda Island. I was pulled into the situation and I ended up doing what I could do, putting on my shrink hat and was able to help resolve the situation peacefully. And the story got into the media and Wells Fargo heard about it. And they were looking for someone who could do threat assessment work around bank robberies and bomb threats and things like that. So they actually had me come in and I ended up um, beginning to do some work for them. And I'd say after about a first year, maybe two years, this was in 1995. I think it was 97 is when I first met my first trader. Um, and it was an institutional trader, it was a bank desk, Wells Fargo. So the very first exposure I ever had to markets and trading very different than most people. It was, I was on a bank desk. It was in a room full of bank traders. That was the first time I'd actually ever seen a trading screen. <laughs> so it's a really different from how most people kind of grow up as a trader. They either grew up on the screen or they made that grow up on the floor and they uh -huh. transferred to the screen. I kind of grew up on a bank desk. Um, so it's kind of an interesting story. And uh, did you know the first time you saw that trading platform with those charts and uh, those numbers moving around that this was something you were really going to dig? It, it bit me very, um, very quickly, like within, I'd say immediately. Um, yeah. I remember going home and talking to my, but at that time it was my, um, oh, we were newly married. It wasn't my fiance, still married, telling her this market stuff's really fascinating. And I think I need to get involved. And so by 97, I opened up my own online account. And fortunately, I was an independent contractor at Wells, so I could trade my own PA, my own personal account. Nice. I wasn't constrained by what their traders had to go through. I had to sign a few forms and whatnot, but I could do my own thing. And it was, it was not easy, to be honest with you, in the beginning. This was also during the big dot-com boom, late 90s. I live in San Francisco, so there was a lot of fast money moving around back in those days. Sure. Um, now, the whole thing with the threat assessment and uh, helping people with that, maybe we should talk. We said, I have, I, have, I have only one default when there's a threat, and that's default to funny, default to humor. I wonder if there's something we could talk about uh, with that. The humor. I love the humor, John. That's a good one. More <laughs> well, people need that one. <laughs> if there was, you know, a, a couple of basic things that you would want to talk about in, in your introduction today, do you have any in mind right now? Yeah. And I think it's, it's especially um, pertinent to the market that we're experiencing right now today 
kind of going through COVID-19, the, the volatility, you know, there's this pain trade going up. Is the market going to keep going up? Here's what I'm going to say. And this is my philosophy as a trading psychologist, which I think applies more now than ever. And it's this. We don't see the market as it is. We see it as we are. What that means is we don't actually see a market objectively. We can never see it objectively. We're always going to be projecting our hopes, fears, beliefs, and emotions onto the market. And that projection creates a structure for us that we end up finding or seeing entries and exits. It's a sort of the 50,000 foot view of it, but that's how I see it. We don't see the market as it is. We see it as we are. As we are. So there's a lot of people that say the markets are irrational, but, but it seems to be, you know, with that statement, it's more the, the, the people that are in the markets, the participants of the markets mm. are the irrational ones. The, the market okay. itself is just a reflection of that. Exactly. The market's going to do what the market's going to do. And it's our job to adapt to whatever it does, really. And there's often, you know, even for the best traders, there's going to be some lag time. Some people, it might take minutes, hours, days, weeks, maybe even months to adapt. But there's an adaption period that has to happen. And it's that, you know, my work, a lot of what I see in my work, I work with a lot of portfolio managers at hedge funds. It's like trying to reduce that lag time. How can they adapt more quickly to what's actually happening right now? Sure. Well, I can I can attest to that. I've had my gears stripped several times uh, through the through the years in in trading. And boy, when there's a swift change in the marketplace, to be able to adapt to that and be creative enough to accept mm. that information as as real information certainly is difficult, right? It's so difficult. We all get caught in the confirmation bias. You know, we we tend to over overemphasize what we already see or what's consistent with our current beliefs and we tend to discount, ignore or maybe even deny information that's contrary to our existing beliefs. So that's just human nature. Mm. Yeah. Well, and how are you coping with the whole the the whole coronavirus situation? I'm sure you're, you know, being very careful like everybody and you feel like that's yeah. affected your trading at all? Um you know, I've actually it's been going well for me, but I will say this. My, my wife now works from home. My college age daughter, my college student daughter, is stuck here at home. And so it has changed a little bit because the energy of the house is different. I'm not home alone trading anymore. And so I often have to keep my door closed like it is right now in my office. Mm -hmm. And so it gets hot, as I was telling you earlier. Right. Um, and so that's one thing I've noticed is I'm having to uh, um, ventilate my space a little bit more. But I'd have to say it... Um, it hasn't changed a lot for me because I was working from home anyways. Um, and I've always been a bit of a homebody, although I like to have adventures and go out and traveling. So I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to getting out, but um, I'm used to sort of being at home. Yeah. See, this is all new for me. I've never worked from home. I've always <laughs> been on a trading floor and then to the office. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of adjustment period for me. And I've got the same thing. I've got, you know, my wife working from home, my, my college age son home, uh, my daughter's going to graduate uh, this year, but she's not planning on coming home. She says uh, she's going to get right out there and having a have a job and get an apartment. So, God bless her. But it's a, it's a little bit of an adjustment, you know. It's a yeah. For me, it's been really just to try and maintain focus with all this going on around me, um, which you know has 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 had its challenges. But I think it's been going pretty well, anyways. All right, so, um, Dr. Medeker, thank you so much. Uh, everybody look for lots of, of more uh, content coming out with The Good Doctor. It'll be a blog. We're going to have a podcast. And we're planning on hopefully having some really good um, big events where you're going to be able to ask the doctor some good questions of, on your own. So um, I guess on that note, doctor, you have anything else to say? I'm looking forward to it, John. And thanks again for reaching out to me. Really, really love getting back and uh, doing some work with you guys. That's great. And, and thank you for everything. So look for great content. Look for the good doctor. We're here to help. We're bringing you the best. Thanks again, doctor. Thank you, John.